Hello, everyone. I'm Emily Cruz. I'm the executive director of the Martin Marty Center for the Public Understanding of Religion, and I am pleased to welcome you to tonight's event, a discussion of Kohelet, Searching for a Life Worth Living by Menachem Fish and Deborah Band. This is the first event in a three-part series entitled Reflections on Judaism and Jewish Life, which the Marty Center is proud to host in partnership with the Greenberg Center for Jewish Studies. The second event, a discussion of a book focused on college sports and Jewish masculinity. I won't say which university because it's not ours. It's Harvard. Um, sorry, any Harvard people. It's a joke. Uh, focused on college sports and Jewish masculinity will be hosted with Professor Jeffrey Stackard on March 27th, and we will be very glad to have you here with us for that one as well. You can find out more information about that event and the series as a whole on our website, martycenter.org. And you can also sign up for our monthly newsletter, which includes notes about the series and all of our other programming. Uh, it is very much my pleasure to introduce the panelists for this evening's discussion. Before I do that, just a quick note on the format. We will have individual presentations from the panelists for around an hour and then about 15 minutes of discussion um, amongst them and from you, the audience. So make sure you're thinking about your Q&A now. There should be time for everyone. Now it's my pleasure to introduce first James T. Robinson, the Dean of the Divinity School here at the University of Chicago and the Caroline E. Haskell Professor of the History of Judaism, Islamic Studies, and the History of Religions. He's also affiliated with many other departments and centers on campus, including tonight's co-host, the Greenberg Center for Jewish Studies. Dean Robinson's research focuses on medieval Jewish intellectual history, philosophy, and biblical exegesis in the Islamic world and Christian Europe. His main interests lie in the literary and social dimensions of philosophy and the relationship between philosophy and religion. He has published four books and three edited volumes, including most recently a co-edited volume entitled Maimonides, Guide of the Perplexed in Translation, A History from the 13th Century to the 20th. Next, Professor Simeon Chevelle, who is professor, uh, Associate Professor of Hebrew Bible and Associate Faculty in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. He is a scholar of the genres techniques, ideas, and histories of the Hebrew Bible, and the society, religion, and history of ancient Israel and Judea. His approach integrates archaeology, the ancient Southwest Asian context, early Jewish interpretation, and modern theory. His book, Oracular Law and Priestly Historiography in the Torah from Moore Zebeck 2014, analyzes the combination of law and narrative in four oracular novellas. Deborah Band draws upon her love of the manuscript arts, and the Jewish textual tradition in her acclaimed Illuminated Manuscripts. She is the author and illuminator of The Song of Songs, The Honey Bee in the Garden, 2005, I Will Wake the Dawn, Illuminated Psalms with Arnold J. Band, 2007, Arise, Arise, Deborah, Ruth, and Hannah with Arnold J. Band, and Kabbalat Shabbat, The Grand Unification with Raymond P. Schneidlin, in 2016. And finally, of course, tonight's book, Kohelet, Searching for a Life Worth Living with Menachem Fish, published this year. She has contributed artwork and essays to many other works of Jewish studies and arts, and is presently collaborating with Arthur Green and Howard Smith in Secrets of Creation, Insights from Mysticism, Modern Science, and Art, based on the works of Rabbi Meyer Ibn Gabay. Her work is widely exhibited across the United States and Canada, including a current exhibition I learned recently in New York. And finally, we have the Joseph and Cecil Meyer Professor Emeritus of History and Philosophy of Science and co-director of the Frankfurt Tel Aviv Center for Religious, Religious and Interreligious Studies at Tel Aviv University, Menachem Fish. He has published widely on the history of 19th century British science and mathematics, on confirmation theory, rationality and agency, the theology of Talmudic literature, and the philosophy of Talmud. Oops, love. I've forward disorganized my papers. Uh, Talmudic legal reasoning. His recent work explores the limits of normative self-criticism, the transformative potential of dialogue, rabbinic literature's dispute of religiosity, the nature of rational scientific framework transitions, reflexive emotions, the possibility of articulating a pluralist and liberal political philosophy from within the assumptions of traditional Judaism, and 
finally, the theopolitical roots of Israel's reaction against political Zionism. He has authored a number of books, most recently the book under discussion this evening, and has a forthcoming co-authored volume entitled Dialogues of Reason, Science, Science, Politics, and Religion. Please welcome me and joining, or please join me in welcoming our esteemed panelists. So, thank you, uh, Dean Robinson, and thank you, Professor Chabel, and uh, Emily Cruz, and Tiffany, and Matt for making for making this happen. Uh, it's not easy to be away from my country at, at this moment, but it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here tonight. And thank you, Deborah, for a roller coaster of three and a half years working on Kohelet across the divide between the very different media in which we work. Okay, so any viable reading of Kohelet uh, uh, must be clear about its overall premise and subsequent question. First posed in verses two and three of the first chapter and repeated throughout the book. Uh, the premise is that all but all is Hevel, a word repeated five times in the opening verse. The question, what Yitaron has a man for all his labor wherein he labors under the sun? I've le left those two key words of the book uh, untranslated for the moment. If all is Hevel, whatever that means, then what Yitaron, whatever that means, can any human endeavor boast to have? Under the sun. Of the two terms, Yitaron is the most straightforward, taken invariably as profit, advantage, or value, but the question of Yitaron uh, uh, changes significantly according to how one understands the word Hevel. Following the Vulgata, as most of you know, most read Hevel as vanity, as connoting meaninglessness and futility, even absurdity which, of course, renders Kohelet's question rhetorical. If anything we can ever th think or do amounts to nothingness, what value indeed can our undertakings ever boast? Kohelet is hence read by many as proving the worthlessness of all serious human effort and as advocating, say, on the basis of chapter 9, enjoying life while one can, while on the basis of 12, uh, at the same time fearing God and obeying his command. But even the best of such readings leave much of the text unattended. The curious change of tone at the beginning of three, the sober counsels of chapter six and seven, the political musings of four, the wise farmer of eleven, and much more. I read Kyle's Hevel premise differently. The term is indeed employed in the Bible to denote meaningless and futility, but only with respect to idolatry and idolaters. When applied to human life, it is, employed, it, it is employed more literally to connote mist-like temporality, which is neither necessarily futile nor absurd. And because applied in Kohelet not only both to the human lifespan and to human understanding and undertaking, I take Hevel as deeming them both to be not merely transient and fleeting, but to be time-bound. If, if all we can ever accomplish is forever contingently grounded in the ever-changing here and now, Kohavit asks, this time not rhetorically, if what we deem undeniably true and good today may be denied tomorrow, what could ever count as an undertaken undertaking, human undertaking, of proven work? How under conditions of perpetual doubt can we lead a life for whose value we can vouch? The next eight verses restate the question in terms of the despairingly incong despairing incongruity between what philosophers dub ontology and epistemology, between nature's timeless law-governed cycles in gold and our time-bound and hence wholly inadequate attempts to picture them in white. 
doomed to live in a world we can never assuredly understand. We, we perceive reality as unfolding in time, while in truth there is nothing new under the sun, and memory also is of no avail because accruing time-bound pictures can never add up or yield a timeless picture. At this point, Kohelet switches from the third person to the tortured personal testimony of a profoundly religious thinker who gave his heart to seeking by wisdom concerning all things under heaven, only to find that what God has given man, note the word given man to be exercised by, is a bad, even evil matter. In Yanra, if I had longer, I'd compare the standard English translations with the way I take the Hebrew original, which I think is far more harsh, far more radical. Talking of what, has, what God has given us to contend with strongly implies that the discrepancy between reality and how we comprehend it is not diminished by divine revelation. Both God's books, that of nature and that of Scripture, are authored in timeless perfection that wholly transcends the ever-changing vagaries of human understanding and are hence ungraspable by, as such by those God made responsible for his world and the covenantal recipients of his word. Oblivious to his standards, how can we prudently subject ourselves to God's will if we can never know it? This states an anxious and distraught Kohelet is the evil and crushing matter. We are obliged by God to respond la notbo, in tortured realization of our total inadequacy to do so. But what causes Kohelet to realize the full horror of his predicament and the two are the two failed attempts to undermine it. Being of supreme win wisdom, he states, speaking as King Solomon, I set upon a keen study of human wisdom, hoping to achieve certain understanding, only to find that even the wisest of humans is only humanly wise, and therefore incapable of surpassing reasons inherent time boundaries. Much wisdom is much anger, chaos, not grief, and he that increases knowledge increases pain, machol, not sorrow. And what cannot be achieved by wisdom cannot be achieved by the best of works. Chapter 2 portrays Solomon's reign as a paradigm of utilitarian morality, not merely the story of a rich man's success, but that of a king who achieved more for his country than any other. Yet Solomon's rule unrivaled, and Sol Solomon's rule's unrivaled achievement are <coughs> also no less transient than his wisdom. And Kohelet's despair knows no limit, causing him to abhor life and to despair of his entire life work. But this is not where Kohelet's argument terminates, as many have it. It is where it begins, according to the reading we proposed. The contrast between the dark loathing of life at the end of two and the buoyant optimism of the Song of Seasons that opens three is dramatic. In realizing that for everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under the heaven, Kohelet seems able to re-embrace life and revisit almost verbatim the heart-gripping quandary from which he set forth, yet with no anger or bitterness. He sees the task. To see is to understand in Kohelet the task with which God gave us to contend with no longer as a painful or evil matter, no longer an inyanra. What I believe Kohelet realizes with a jolt at the opening of three is that although God's timeless ways and perfect norms are indeed humanly unknowable, to hold us accountable to standards we're incapable of knowing would constitute a violation of God's perfection. Because he cannot but be aware of our inherent time-boundedness, it is unthinkable that he'd hold us to his timeless standards. And hence, I read three's opening verse thus, Because God created us and our world in time, there must also be a time for every divine desire and expectation of us under the heaven, chefetz being the Hebrew word for God's will.
God will judge us not by his timeless standards, but by the time-bound quality of our time-bound assessments. He does not expect us to arrive at absolute criteria for planting, building, or waging war, but to do our time-bound best to determine whether now is the time to plant or uproot, uh, to kill or heal, to wage war or make peace. With a great sigh of relief, Kohelet realizes that the task we face is no longer devastating. God has given, again the word given, the world in our heart, knowing that we cannot comprehend it from beginning to end. We are expected to do our humanly possible, context-dependent, time-bound best to do good, not to somehow meet unknowable divine standards. In referring back to the world, we can't fully grasp Kohelet enables today's readers, like yourselves, to appreciate his change of heart. The very idea of a proven scientific truth we now realize is a conceit. Scientific laws cannot be proved. Scientists form hypotheses, test them, and replace them when found wanting. <coughs> At its very best, science remains underdetermined and fallible. Yet no one would consider science to be absurd or futile. Kohelet will extend this insight according to our reading to all serious human judgment and attempt to determine what amounts to doing one's humanly best in this regard. He embarks on his own positive account of wise human conduct with a powerful, if largely misread, image. What Yitaron has the wise man more than the fool? And the standard translation is here, and the translation I prefer is below it, which, and his answer is, uh, um, what a poor man has who knows to go against life. Lahaloch negedachayim, to go against life or his life. Critical of what life's dealt them and determined to change it, poor people assume responsibility by imagining ways to improve their world, scrutinizing them critically before settling on a way forward. Keenly combining value judgment and informed speculation, they apply their standards of propriety to exposing what they deem to be wrong and imagine putting right, knowing that uh, they are liable to err and even, if right, to be unsuccessful. But Kohelet also knows that even the wisest, self, uh, the, even the wisest or self-critics, because we use our norms to criticize it, it, it is impossible for us to uh, 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 hold that, them, our norms, in critical check merely by talking to us. Chapter seven is about enhancing self-criticism by self-exposure deliberate self-exposure to similarly trying situations and normative critique of others, better to seek a good name among people than precious ointment, or to go to houses of mourning rather than those of mirth, to see, seek the rebuke of the wise rather than the praise of fools and so forth. It ends with the sobering realizations that even maxims considered undeniably valid, such as forever to avoid the company of certain types of corrupt women remain uncertain because they can never be applicable with, some, with certainty. After ingeniously combating the only rival position he deems serious, which is benign hedonism, and setting an aristophanic dystopia of a city run by fools against a Kohelet wise farmer hedging his bets in the face of uncertainty, Kohelet, having solved this problem, can declare in deliberate contrast to chapter two's dark despair that raising our eyes from our human vantage point under the heaven, truly the light is sweet and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun, no longer crushed by the un unreachable chasm between God in heaven and we upon the earth, we have come to understand that despite our heaven existence, it is possible to lead a divinely approved life wisely led and worth living. And he can finally face death, not as a denial, not as a denial of life's worth, but as a natural development, tenderly describing us departing the world accompanied by the equally transient, soon to be outmoded, 
fruits of our accomplishments, which uh, uh, Deborah, as you will see, captures so vivid. As my late father, Harold Fish, aptly noted, never has there a gentler, never has, never was there a gentler poem on the approach of death, which becomes the beauty of a golden sunset as the dust returns to the earth and the spirit to meet its maker. At the end of our book, when all is said and done, I briefly address Kohavet's litur liturgical placement. Why is it ritually read <coughs> at, in the Jewish synagogue during the festival of Tabernacle, Sukkot, deemed to be by the rabbis to be the most joyous of Jewish festivals? Well, Sukkot is the festival, of course, that is dedicated in the main to exchanging our permanent dwellings for taking up residence in unstable temporary booths in celebration of our essential transient time-boundedness, an expression of our joyful satisfaction. My, my rendition of Simcha in Kohele, um, in real realizing that we can pursue divinely sanctioned lives of real value um, uh, despite our thoroughgoing Hebel existence. Thank you so very much. I'm so grateful to Dean Robinson, Professor Chevelle, um, for inviting us, and to Emily Cruz and Tiffany um, Annette for all their work hosting us. It's, it's just an honor and a pleasure to be with you to share this project, whose seed was planted in a family tragedy in my family 35 years ago, but has flowered in this remarkable project with Menachem. I'll show you how an illuminated manuscript can do far more than enhance the aesthetics and emotions of a reader's experience, but actually interpret and amplify the subtleties of the text, um, relate it to our greater world, creating a coherent visual midrash. Unlike medieval Christian art, the imagery in Jewish art has tended to be uh, narrative or simply decorative, rarely intended to convey complex abstract ideas. My challenge over more than three decades has been to develop a modern Jewish iconographic vocabulary capable of teasing out abstract concepts in visual form. Following the lead of Van Eyck, yes. um, as analyzed by Erwin Panofsky, I create disguised symbolism in a scene that usually makes logical sense, all explained in my painting by painting commentaries in each of my books. Here, I base my visual midrash of Kohelet that runs through 60 paintings on Menachem's Hevel premise that the human lifespan is short, and not only we, but all our discrete deeds are transient vapor. Nothing lasts forever. And separated as we are from the divine, we cannot possibly fathom God's expectations of us. Although we know we ultimately face divine judgment. Let me show you how this visual midrash of Kohelet works. You see here a painting of the Alhambra on its ridge in Granada. The micrographic border surrounding the painting, I've got a detail of it there, uh, presents roughly the first third of Kohelet. You'll see the remainder in the next slide. So why the Alhambra? This corresponds to Menachem's Hebel premise. Just as our lives and endeavors are ephemeral, so too are our grandest, most exquisite monuments. I extend a ubiquitous midrashic metaphor comparing heaven to a palace to describe human life and deeds, and what grander palace than the Alhambra, the wondrously beautiful medieval palace and gardens of the Muslim Nazareth rulers of Granada. Also, the site of much of the vibrant, poetry-filled court life of the medieval Sardi community. Yet, even this mass of glory crumbles slowly into the red dust from which it arose. Mist invades everything. The golden rim of the painting alludes to the golden bowl in the 12th chapter, not yet cracked here, 
and haunts the entire manuscript. Watch closely as I explain this visual midrash and its varied and complex symbolism in the few paintings that I can show you now. Uh, yeah, okay. On the Hebrew page, the philosopher's eye, Menachem's here, peers through the initial letter, the plain clay jar spilling the jewels that tumble down around the words describe in a midrash quoted for each of the books attributed to Solomon, that wise king's unsealing of the wisdom of Torah. The rabbis compare the Torah to a sealed jar full of jewels, but only when open and spilled could the riches be found. This was Solomon when he composed Kilpellet. And I'll leave you to explore the meaning of the English painting in the book. The philosopher compares the immutable cycle of life to the endless daily journey of the sun and to the water cycle. The mosaic repeats its own complex man-made pattern endlessly in colors that echo the sea, sky, sunlight, and forests. Outside, ephemeral mist, Hevel, rises from the gardens below into the clouds only to fall to land and sea as rain. The cloud of micrographic text in the Hebrew illumination includes passages of, of Ketra Malchut, the royal crown, by Solomon ibn Gabiral, uh, the philosopher and poet who indeed lived and worked in the Alhambra. The passages ponder our inability to comprehend God's eternity and lament the clouds of human imperfection that obscure humanity's view of divine wisdom. Gazing from his high tower, the omnipotent ruler despairs of the ephemerality of even his powerful life. The Hebrew word ani, I, rests upon a regal carpet. The English pronoun I rests upon a clay bulla of the Judean royal seal, and the balustrade is from Ramat Rachel, hinting at the monumental palace that Kohelet Solomon avatar inhabits. The starry sky is adapted from a famous Hubble Space Telescope image of the ultra-deep field of space that I have long used to symbolize God's invisible but all-suffusing presence, and in this book, to allude to how every particle of our world has cycled endlessly through the stars. Can one find wisdom by indulging in luxury? Kohelet's sensual pleasure and pride in his material achievements are clouded by his realization that all his luxuries evaporate. The cherry branches of Washington, D.C., where these illuminations were painted, progress through their annual cycle, reminding him of the passing of generations. The drifting fog expresses the ephemerality of all his wealth here under the sun. At right, with the first verse of the chapter, the philosopher king gazes into a garden pond reflecting the endless sky. Kohelet begins to find comfort despite human limitations on wisdom as he meditates further on how every situation in life has its moment, even if that moment is unknowable to any but God. He perceives life as a stream always subject to sudden turbulence. The little mosaic at the top of the stream bears part of the musical notation of what else but Pete Seeger's famous 1965 um, song, Turn, Turn, Turn. Had to be there. Here, Kohelet turns to consider the foolishness of oppressors and plutocrats in the face of both human and divine authority. The Hebrew illumination presents the ancient flail and sword, while the English illumination begins with more modern tools of oppression and coins spill everywhere. Again, the starlit heavens of the Hubble image, again, divine intent obscured from human view by clouds of mist. Kohelet warns his students to avoid hazardous behavior and instead pursue wise, careful self-conduct. The micrographic woman at the right of the English painting gathers her fruit. He's dangling. And she is composed of verses in Proverbs 9 and 13, known in Jewish tradition as a powerful woman, Ashit Kyle, all extolling Lady Wisdom. Conversely, Kohelet warns of, of temptation by reckless, illicit women, characterized in Proverbs 9.13 by the feminine gender, Silut, 
of the same word seal, fool, that Kohelet continually applies to his negative role model. Thus, the dancing woman rattles a tambourine, such as one might have seen in evening entertainments in the Alhambra, um, and she is composed of the aria Libiamo in the first act of Verdi's La Traviata, the interchange between the courtesan Violetta and Alfredo Germont. These soon-to-be lovers sing to each other about how life is all about embracing the pleasure of the moment. Now, this is a good place to show you another image that appears here, and in fact, on every uh, one of these paintings. You can see a small honeybee in each. There's a close-up down here. Uh, my name, Dora, is the Hebrew word for honeybee. And uh, since long before I started keeping bees, uh, placing a bee in each painting is my play on the medieval custom of the colophon identifying a scribe. Let me focus on the English painting here. The text begins with a painting of a crown lying in a gutter, a cautionary tale inspired by both Napoleon's remark about the crown of France lying in the gutter and General George Patton's observation that at Roman generals' triumph parades, a slave stood behind the conqueror holding a golden crown and whispering in his ear a warning that all glory is fleeting. The decorative text bordering the English page illustrates the dangers attendant upon the honest courtier with Cordelia's speech from the beginning of King Lear that I have not sighed. Know before whom you stand, Dalif Nemiata Omed, crowns the grand portal to this palace, just as, as it has crowned the holy ark in synagogues across the centuries. All of the diverse and busy lives of the palace whether child or adult, laborer or scholar or aristocrat, all paths lead away from the sunlit courtyard toward shadow, oblivion, and certain divine judgment. Laborers and aristocrats fill the courtyards, and in the distance, an old man hobbles into the inescapable misty darkness at the end of the great halls. Even the solid stone palace betrays its impermanence. Nothing in the palace of human life lasts forever. Kohelet's gentle pean to the end of human life under the sun warns us never to forget inevitable divine judgment of our actions. The courtyard of his palace is filled with biblical symbols of fruitfulness, humility, the value of law, all exhortations to live mindful of Torah, all explained in my commentary. Far beneath the heavens, night falls over the palace of the philosopher king. Oh, really? Was I off kilter? I'm sorry. I screwed up. Sorry. Um, far beneath the heavens, night falls over the palace of the philosopher king. The golden bowl framing the scene has finally cracked. The micrography presents poems from Ben Kohelet, the reflections on the biblical book by Samuel the Nagid, Grand Vizier, one of the Jewish Grand Viziers in the Alhambra. The poem surrounding the text page expresses the poet's determination to pursue life despite its transience. Kohelet's last words rest within fig branches cycling through their seasons, symbolizing the birth and passing of generations and the goodness of divine law. The acorns are the oak's future alluding to Israel's endurance despite the passing of every individual and even the kingdom itself. Isaiah prophesied that Israel would be reborn after conquest like the terebinth and the oak, of which stumps are left even when they are felled. Its stump shall be a holy seed. Like the oak seed and regenerating stump, long after his own death, Kohelet's words continue to offer humankind guidance toward a realistic yet meaningful life. Thank you. I'd like to share um, what it's like to read uh, this book. 
what it's like for me to read this book. It's quite an experience. It's a it's a work thick experientially. It starts with a very uh, curious fact, um, really with with Menachem's story with which he opens his introduction, that the idea to think about Kohelet, pay attention to Kohelet, and develop his own reading of Kohelet starts with his father, Harold Fish, who wrote a book, Poetry with a Purpose. Poetry with a Purpose, which came out in 1992, was the first book I ever read in biblical studies, and that's why I'm here today. So we talked a little bit back and forth about that fact. Menachem writes in his introduction that... Uh, he learned from his father how to read, how to think, and then had his own different idea. And he had to develop his own idea because his father was so alluring and so wrong. (laughs) And I had a similar experience, heavy on the allure, and over time come to my own ideas about how to read works. For me, um, part of what made a large part of what made poetry of the purpose so significant was I was an English lit major in college and this was my last year and I came across this book in a other setting, not in college, but outside somewhere. And I thought to myself, oh, oh, one can read the Bible. You can actually read it. It's literature. Different parts of it have shape, beginnings, middle, end. And most important of all, they have tone. You can hear punchlines, parodies, rhetorical questions. You can hear personalities speaking. It's literature, but literature in the most dramatic sense. Now, I'd grown up, the only way to read the Bible was verse, medieval commentary. Verse, medieval commentary. Where does it start? When you're old enough to read a verse out of commentary, when does it end? When you die. There's no shape. It goes on and on and on, and suddenly it has shape. And if it has shape, it's got meaning. And you make the meaning. This was like literally a revelation about the Bible. (laughs) This was revelation. Uh, And it started me on my path. Menachem also has a really intriguing starting point that gets him into Kohelet, and that's his idea of dialogism. And it it, it, it really suffuses the entire book as an intellectual, or I should say cognitive, experience. Um, what Menachem means by dialogism is what he alluded to in his opening remarks, that since we are committed to our our own ideas and we use our ideas to critique others, we're really in no position to critique ourselves. How do we use our own ideas and commitments to critique ourselves? It's a trap. It's very hard also to go to someone else and be persuaded. We don't talk with other people to be persuaded. And so the best way to think about how to improve ourselves is by listening to people we know we disagree with, but Listen for the things that make me think again about the things I'm committed to and the way I'm committed to them. So it's a very intriguing form of conversation. And damn, if it doesn't ring true for me. It's very hard to persuade me of anything if I'm not the one persuading myself. But how do I do that? By listening willingly uh, you know, to people I cherish, people I care about, people who thought about things, or people who catch me unawares. <laughs> uh, and this this was a very moving moment to hear him articulate this as a philosophy, as a way of thinking about things. Menachem comes to this by way of the Talmud, says this is the way the Talmud works in its posing of a, of a concept and then questioning it and then going back and forth on what are the implications. And either it's a voice grappling with itself or it's two voices grappling with each other. One way or the other or another, when a person reads it, chants it, engages with it, it's themselves engaging in that anyway. So, you know, you end, it ends up being modeled in that, in that way. When we come to uh, Deborah's side of the uh, introduction, the introduction is also starts very personal. 
And then it helps round out the picture for you of, well, how do we ground Kohelet the person? And how do we ground Kohelet the book and the ideas? Um, and quickly we learn uh, there's a very personal side uh, both to each of their stories, but also their cousins. First cousins? Second, Second cousins. And they've got a long running productive relationship as cousins. In fact, my butt in with one perfect fact. The name of this hall is Swift. The family that we're late through is named Swift. Elegant, elegant. Couldn't have planned that better. So to, to, to be brought into this book is to be brought into a thick world of, for me, personalities, ideas, people, family. So I, you know, I can bring out what sounds like a curiosity, but it's actually an inherent part of the book. Because this is a collaboration between two people who could not have done this if they didn't already cherish each other. Because the modes of this book are so different that they couldn't complement each other if you don't come into it and know these are people who care to do it this way together. That there is a giving up of something, of a commitment to certain forms of articulation and expression and, and engagement couldn't work if they didn't have that charity. How do you communicate that charity to a reader? That is a trick. I think in this book, it's a very effective one. On Deborah's side, instead of a single argument, although now I appreciate better the through line, much better, um, the mode of interaction is also dialogical, but in a different way. It's dialogical because we get a uh, modes of, rep of presentation or representation answering each other. So it's a verbal text and then there's a visual overlay, but the visual overlay is together with the text. It's not just like there's a kind of pl bland representation of the text or a page that it's cued to, but the text is woven into the image or around the image. And the images also include other text. So a word and image are in this uh, dialectical interaction uh, that you go through as you, as you work your way through the material. So that makes it very rich, very thick, and you're, you know, it, it would keep you uh, off balance, but there's also a verbal commentary to the visual, which you got, you know, sort of in a very uh, pleasant uh, way. And in the book you have it, also with images and then commentary on the images. So there's, you know, a decoder ring is there in the book. It's very nice. Uh, and so it's a very thick uh, and different uh, expression of the dialogism that suffuses, that suffuses the book. Um, in the Hebrew Union College in New York, I've learned where uh, Jim and Kate LaBeouf just went on a fundraising mission uh, not to Hebrew Union College, but to New York, uh, to New York City, there is a, that would be funny, wouldn't it? <laughs> that would be Hevel. <laughs> There's a room with Deborah's artwork, the artwork that became the material for the book. It's a room that goes all the way around where it's all hung. And Kay took a video of it and sent it to me. And that was, in, and even though I'm looking at it in my teeny weeny little phone, I feel like I got into this room this size. The mind trick is, is, is intriguing. And to see the work wrap all the way around um, is to see verses and sections uh, encapsulated, expressed, and projected into, which I'll get to in a second, other places and, 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 and contexts. All, and then go all the way around the room. If Menachem's work tries to synthesize everything and a philosopher's argument, I think Deborah's work is very rabbinic and midrashic in excerpting verses, selections of verses, phrases, and trying to capture the spirit of an entire chapter, work, mood. And, uh, you know, so you get these isolated uh, expressions all the way around the room and together this is what's in the book and so you know it projects outwards so you have these two dynamics uh if you like uh, terminology and binaries call it centripetal and centrifugal maybe that works for you uh it came to my mind as i was thinking about this uh but you have these two dynamics working together 
Um, and it's not an easy fit. It's not a natural fit. And you work through the book to make it work. And you want to do it because the effort that they put into it is immense. And because the uh, charity that they have towards each other is felt throughout the work. And so there's a, it's a very, um, it's a very thick and inviting book, uh, one that one has to work through. Now, um, dialogism has uh, another meaning uh, to some of us. Oh, sorry. There's one more. There's one more dimension to the dialogism that I that I want to reference, and that's you know what Deborah mentioned uh, using largely Spain, many other things too, all along the way. It's very thick in its historical evocation, the artwork. But using Spain, if if Kohelet says you know, I did everything. I'm the poster boy for kingship. I achieved everything a king is supposed to do. And when I tell you it's limited, trust me, nobody knows better than me. Well, Deborah took this and said, okay, let's think of our most grandiose historical period, uh, one that, you know, falls away. And that, that becomes a historical and imaginary, you know, backdrop for, uh, thinking about the work. And so you get a dialogism between Kohelet, the text, and Spain. Uh, and that and that already is another adds another dimension to the experience of dialogism that suffuses um, the work. Now I come from a very different world of di dialogism. Uh, the dialogism, uh, at least as someone has translated it, of Bartin. And that dialogism has an edge to it. And things are never just quite paired. Things are cited. And the framing of citation comes with meaning. And often, in, and when, when a citation is framed in that way, it's usually not, um, it's not uh, valorizing. It's usually got a, a critique to it, an edge. Quoting someone has the element of a potential sting to it because now I'm making it my words. And the offsetting it is an offsetting of social registers. Who is elite? Who's not elite? Who comes from a region? Who comes from another one region? Who comes from another region? That there is a constant uh, agonism or antagonism between quoted and quoter. The quoter owns the quoted and shapes their language around it. And it each is inflected with the other, and it's a very complex set of analyses. And this is how I read the book of Kohelet. Uh, so I have a completely different reading. Um, but tonight, instead of engaging in a Bartinian dialogism and say, you know, giving my alternative on why, I'm going to leave it at this and say, invite you to come enjoy this work. What I would like to do, just start off, since I am low-tech uh, from the beginning to the end, is to share the book with you, uh, because we don't have a copy, and I'll hand it to you, and, and let you hand it around to me. Because that is, I have one in my back, and we have an story, so you really have to know the truth. Can you hear that? So thank you, Menachem. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Simi. All really fantastic. And I, I think really the only thing I should say is uh, Sof Tabara Kol Nishma. Uh, <laughs> the end of the matter, all has been heard. Uh, there really isn't much to add after these wonderful presentations, not only because I started as first and ended as last. Uh, so uh, first is last and last is first, I suppose. Uh, what I would like to do is just add some remarks about uh, personal reflection, as did Simi and all of us, that's inspired by the opening remarks in the in the book, and to move it in the opposite direction that Simi went, as I'm a medievalist and he's a Bible scholar. Um, and thank you, Emily, and thank you, Tiffany, and thank you, Lauren, uh, and thanks to everyone who helped to uh, put this event together. 
Um, the two opening pieces of the work, uh, introductions written by, by Menachem and Deborah, do express really quite movingly the origin of the book and the ideas that frame it throughout. Uh, Menachem, uh, the struggling with the philosophy of the work and the and the attempt to um, remove himself from his father's influence. Uh, so it is the love of commentary plays out through uh, uh, adolescence and liberation from from one's uh, mentor. What it really means to become a, an adult. Uh, Deborah's and it is focused on philosophy principally and always. Uh, you are a philosopher through and through, and not everything. Everything is philosophy, and everything one might argue is religious philosophy, as the term that you introduced for Kohelet and for your own work uh, throughout um, throughout your career, really, and also in this uh, singular commentary. Uh, Deborah focuses on, interestingly, history in the introduction, and I think it's quite significant to point out that the artist is interested in context, in historical context, for an obvious reason, how to picture what's going on, how to represent it, how to create some sort of visual experience of, 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 uh, of the event, and as Jimmy uh, remarked as well, um, uh, it is also uh, full of the sources from traditional Judaism, which are everywhere present in your commentary on your own images, uh, which are representing the meaning of the book, uh, quite uh, strikingly different from your philosophical commentary, which has almost no, if not almost no, are there any Jewish sources throughout the commentary? There are, there's not a single Jewish source. No rabbinic, maybe references to other biblical sources, but yes. Tom Huber. Besides you, Talmudic, of course, uh, but no, uh, medieval. Uh, what I'd like to say is, uh, contrary to uh, Simi, who, who emerged from a world in which uh, text and commentary prevailed to one in which dialogue and literature, uh, I was the opposite, opposite direction. I discovered Kohelet and, and a love for Kohelet in graduate school under the influence of someone who's, whose presence is sorely missed even now, some 20 years after an accident, Avias Urovitsky a voice who would be very welcome in this moment uh, right now. Avia Zorovitsky introduced me to Samuel Vintibon, who is a 13th century commentary on the book Kohelet and the text that really defined my understanding of it ever since. Vintibon's commentary on Kohelet in the 13th century also defined my understanding of commentary itself as a specific genre, a form. And what I'd like today in these just brief comments to bring uh, this session to a close as quickly as possible so people can ask questions of our of our honored guest is to make a few remarks about the form of the book um, uh, drawing from my medieval background and um, asking a few questions of you to get the process started. Uh, from the medieval perspective, you would really ask four questions of every text, uh, whether it exists, and this book certainly exists, what it is, a description of, of the contents, which you have done so beautifully, the two of you and Simi, uh, from a different perspective as well, and I'll, I'll return to it as well. How it is, meaning what its characteristics are, in this case, really how to read it, how it works. Uh, and this, I think, is the most important question of all, which I've struggled with at, uh, throughout my reading of the work, how the two parts of the commentary fit together, uh, how you can read them together and how they influence each other or change each other or argue with each other? And then why? Uh, what is the purpose of the text? What does it accomplish? I will modify it slightly uh, in my why questions to ask really why you did certain things, what choices you made, and why you made those choices throughout this really quite extraordinary book, really quite magnificent book. If I was first, I would start with praise, but in, in the end, I, I, I'd begin with questions. Uh, it really is magnificent. And I would say it is a medieval text in many respects. Uh, so what is this work? The work is, in its simplest form, a illuminated copy of Kohelet with text and translation followed by commentary. That's a very simple explanation of what's going on. It is, however, much more complicated. It is, besides in, and, uh, uh, bracketing the two brief introductions, it is an illuminated uh, text of Kohelet, um, Hebrew text and translation, with an extended philosophical commentary chapter by chapter, discursive to the, to the bones, uh, argument after argument, trying to make a singular uh, statement around a 12-chapter book with complex moves throughout. Uh, it is also a second commentary, or really a super commentary, a commentary on the images which are a commentary on the text. So it really is three 
works, uh, text and translation, commentary and commentary on the images, which are a commentary. It is quite complex. It is like nothing I have experienced before, and I've read many, many medieval commentaries and, and far fewer uh, modern commentaries. There really is nothing like it. Uh, and yet, uh, it is so similar to the medieval context. Your commentary, Menachem, fits perfectly in the medieval world. It would be an example of how one reads a biblical text as a, as a religious philosopher in the Middle Ages. One, however, would be working with medieval sources, not post-Kantian uh, world of philosophy and Karl Popper. And your images, your illuminations, draw so heavily from the medieval tradition as well, from classical, but especially medieval. And not only with the images and ideas, as with your use of the Alhambra, you are a medievalist at core. Uh, good. See? Uh, see, we bring out the most important uh, points through, through questioning. Uh, not only the, um, not only the um, images and the ideas that you choose to, to use, especially the Alhambra and Islamic Spain from the Middle Ages, uh, but the techniques, the use of the uh, ornate uh, first letter of verses is, is right out of medieval illuminated book tradition. Uh, micrography, of course, is a very old tradition, and you have mastered it quite extraordinarily. The first few pages of the book, as you see when passing it around, is a complete copy of Kohelet written in micrographic form, which is really quite extraordinary, as are the images, the, the dancing, uh, maidens uh, collecting uh, grapes. So what is it? What is it in a core is, is several things that fit together in a complicated way. A philosophical commentary on a, on a complex, a difficult, inscrutable, challenging, irrita irritating a biblical book, which provides a very new perspective through uh, the use of a, a philosophical tradition quite foreign to it. Drawing from post-Kantian philosophy, the philosophy you know best, uh, you provide a new reading, a, a, a consistent reading, a continuous reading, a discursive reading. So it is that it is also a second commentary, a commentary on the commentary, really, in which, as Simi describes so carefully, it presents something quite, quite different, a traditional commentary of sorts, a commentary that does almost nothing but draw from traditional Jewish sources. You use other biblical verses to frame it, from Psalms, Job, uh, uh, Ecclesiastes, um, Lamentations, uh, the Torah. Uh, you cite uh, Midrash, of course, for the many statements about uh, Kohelet within the canon and within Solomon's uh, wisdom tradition. Uh, you have Targum, you have liturgy, uh, you have uh, the medievals uh, quite strikingly, and I will be moving toward my question in a moment, but you have the medievals quite strikingly represented in all of this micro micrographic representation. Uh, medievals, not surprisingly, from Spain, including the poems of Samuel and Akid and uh, Solomon ibn Gabirol. Uh, and then some early modern uh, as well. You cite Turn, Turn, Turn uh, from Pete Seeger and from um, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. No, who else taught this thing? The birds, the birds. So I show I'm not as old as I look if the birds doesn't come <laughs> immediately to my mind. The Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew translation of that song that came out in Israel, did he recognize it? Was called, and he said, on, 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 on the album jacket, it says, Words and Music, Pete Seeger. <laughs> yeah, that is uh, something about translations into Hebrew of movies as well. <laughs> Biblical citations that get translated literally and make no sense whatsoever in Hebrew. Um, so what is the work? It is this. It is these two very different approaches to the text. One philosophical to the core, one modern contemporary, a response to Karl Popper and one traditional to the core, one that uh, draws heavily from rabbinic sources, biblical and medieval. How is this text? How does it work? How does one read the text? And what I would say is you really need to read it again and again and again to understand the interaction between the two parts of the book. What I think it is supposed to be, uh, or what it could be, and this I really want to hear what you say about how it developed, uh, there is a term used in Plato scholarship called the argument and the action. It is in some ways the argument and the action. Uh, Menachem provides the argument and the action, the drama, the poetry, is through the images that then are explained uh, through your text. So how should one read it? One should read it by engaging the two different parts of it constantly to figure out how they interact with each other. Uh, what you described, um, Devorah, Deborah, is, uh, is, uh, is the goal from the very beginning to produce images that somehow fleshed out the meaning of Menachem's argument. And this applies especially with the first 
um, unique translation of not so unique of Hevel's vapor and following it through throughout the text. Um, what I would suggest, however, that that is perhaps obvious to you and maybe not so obvious to others. What you've set up, uh, again, as Simi described so well, uh, is a uh, an argument and an action that works in a complex way, also in the spirit of medievals. How you should read this text and how I would advise people to read it is to read it again and again, again and again, looking for ways that the two parts of it argue against each other. Uh, when does the traditional rabbinic voice that's presented through the images and through the commentary work against the philosophical analytical voice of Popper and your response to it? And when vice versa, does philosophy stand supreme and can be independent entirely of the poetic representation of what's going on? A few questions, and then I leave it to you to, to respond. One is precisely that. Is it one commentary or is it two? And can you give more examples of how the two aspects of the work, the philosophical and the poetic work together? Uh, two, why did you choose Spain? You say you're a medievalist, but it is a striking setting. You could have chosen many things. Uh, Solomon, of course, is the king, uh, and uh, and Spain in the Middle Ages was perceived as the as Yerushalayim Tana and a Agalut Yerushalayim Asher B'Sfarad. It is uh, the exiled Jerusalem in, in Spain, as it were, in Sfarad. Uh, but you could have chosen other places as well, uh, and you could have been driven by different uh, medieval traditions. Why? Why Daf, but why specifically medieval Spain? I've always been captured by the use, by the, the absolutely, if I said, ubiquitous metaphor of the palace for the for, for God's domain, for, for the heavens, um, and the earth as, as um, the earth as the palace stockings. And um, and I decided that I was going to work with that as the me as the central metaphor, sort of the tent ball around which I could hang it. Yeah. Um, and the you know, what what greater palace could you possibly that than the Alhambra? Mm -hmm. And it's a boot. If you walk around it, you see that things have started to crumble. Um, it will not last forever. You should not why it's pronounced as Venice, yeah. But um, but it's also ephemeral, and it. it Hey, you had a flash, and um, and just what that you remarkably well. I had it, it has to be the thought at that moment, yet yeah, about its potential to belong in the, the starting poet and then to how it did, um, um, Shabal Hanaki's reflection on the on Kelpel. I did it getting fine into the few weeks before this day. I thought I needed to start as anything that was accepted, it just came out. Inspiration. And so that leads to the final question, the most important question of all, coming from a medievalist who works principally on the history of philosophy. Uh, it is quite uh, striking that you have a philosophical commentary, a Jewish philosophical commentary on Kohelet that do does not include a single reference to the many medievals who cite Kohelet, frequently explain it, develop their ideas through it. Kohelet is the most important text, one might argue, for the development of Jewish philosophy from late antiquity, certainly from the ninth century forward. And yet there is no, uh, for instance, Bach ibn Parkour, there's no Judah Haredi, there's no Maimonides, and you can go further. There are no references either um, for a, ever to the commentary tradition of the Midi. There's a reason for that. There is a little, um, the, 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 the um, Midrashic literature is usually the core of my interpretations of, of text. I couldn't work with it in this case, or I could work with very little of it. The rabbis clearly understood, clearly understood what Kohelet was all about. Um, far better than those who came after the King James translation that used vanity for Hevel, that translated Hevel um, metaphorically instead of literally as vapor. Um, the Midrash on Kohelet is not, not the coherent thing that most, that say, um, Shir Hashim Rabbah um, or Tehillim, Tehillim Rabbah, that the great collections of Midrash on, on, on other books tend to be. Um, it's, it's a patchwork, and the 
Targum, the Aramaic transliteration, or paraphrase rather, of uh, the Aramaic paraphrase on Kohelet was meant to be used in the, as the translation in synagogue or synagogue readings is goes out of its way to take each passage from Kohelet, interpolate other texts that turns it on its head and gives the, so that the congregation listening to it would, would hear a much more traditional sort of Torah true message about how the good things you do in your life will win you a place in heaven. And that's simply not what Kohelet is saying. They go, they, they, they go like this to make the book say something different than it meant. But in flashes in the Midrash, you can see that they understood exactly what it meant. But the Midrash seems to have been, it seems, my understanding is that it's sort of an educational Midrash um, that w where bits and pieces of Kohelet were used to substantiate or to explain other passages in the Bible. It's not the coherent thing that actually comments on Kohelet itself. So if I will then end now after a few questions with the challenge uh, to the both of you as you work toward the second volume of you of Borkan Kohelet, illuminated, <laughs> and take into consideration some of the media. Um, there is a commentary tradition that I don't think is, is very familiar to many people, which is the tradition that I had focused on mainly in the Arabic world, in the Islamic world, the Judeo Arabic, and also the philosophical commentaries on Bible. But just for what it's worth to add, uh, perhaps one, uh, one uh, more illumination. Uh, one of the standard translations of Havel in Arabic is Haba, uh, which means dust, uh, evanescent dust. Another is Mustayil, uh, which means like it can blow on the wind. It's, it's, a, it's temporal. Another is Kasa, uh, which is like chat, which blows in the wind. So uh, the Arab, uh, the Jews writing in the Islamic world, I uh, really got it. And they developed commentaries that are quite strikingly similar to yours, when not all beautiful. And, and it would be fun to set it in conversation with you yeah. along with true, making philosophical sense. With, uh, with that, I want to step aside and let you answer the many questions that I'm sure all of you have. Thanks again. Can I, can I respond? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, let me say the following. I mean, the key to understanding what I'm doing is not where I come from. Latter day Neo Kantian, Neo Hegelian, Anglophile philosophy. No, it's to understand the question that motivates me, the big question about Kohelet. The big question about Kohelet is what, what on earth is it doing in the biblical canon? Um, I mean, this is the question that R.B. Y. Scott starts off with, saying that Kohenet is the strangest book in the Bible. And it's the strangest book in the Bible because it makes no, it, it's obviously monotheistic. Um, before any other monotheism is around, there's one God in heaven, creator of all, judges us all, uh, we're accountable to, and so on and so forth. And yet he makes absolutely no mention of revelation, prophecy, covenant, Torah, except for hinting about what God gave us, but without giving it any context. And that was the question I was grappling. And I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, but because that, that is not, you know, the, the, the area of discourse which I, I feel con competent to speak of, but the medieval commentaries do not raise that question. If, if Am I correct? Oh, no, they always raise it. It's always oh, the first Okay, so, 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 okay. so, so I, I, I've learned something very, very important tonight, which I wasn't aware of. So my answer to the question was that this is a pre-revelatory book by a very religious thinker trying to work out the questions that need to be addressed before the 23 other books of the Bible can be open. And that is the nature of human understanding, which is always through language. And our languages are time-bound in the deepest sense, historical sense of the term. Everyone speaks with a, a slightly different vocabulary, with different uh, vocabularies of images, 
and different understanding. Now, how, how can we understand the word, the world with any certainty, or for that matter, the Torah with any, any certainty, if everyone reads it by definition different? Okay. Yes. So Kohenet is grappling with that question, answering it, and the very last four verses of the book I don't see as a sort of apologetic later uh, appended. Okay, but but the, the the wisdom given to the wise people from the one shepherd who study it in 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 in, in, in collections among people are exactly the way Kohala diverse, okay, and, and will always be diverse and always we mediated and filtered and reflected through the lens of the particular language the reader is reading now. Now, all within the Jewish tradition, the only large corpus I know, um, and, and this is my limitation, who takes this as a basic premise is the Talmudic literature, which is totally, totally, read my lips, indifferent to the problem of truth both in its midrashic undertaking, its vast, its exegetical undertaking, it does not produce one authoritative reading of one verse claiming that this is what God meant. No, the varachir, the varachir, there's always another, another opinion and another opinion, and they, they're never ever adjudicated. It's that plurality of, 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 of meanings which is the norm of Torah study. And in Halakha, I would claim it's the same, where the Babylonian Talmud, the crowning achievement of that literature, not only uh, uh, sets the different understandings of every single Mishnahite reads, every single legal uh, um, uh, uh, ruling it reads, but pits them against each other, semi, in totally fabricated, keen and intense and detailed dialogue, which is as Bakhtinian as it gets. And, and Danny Boyarin, who claims that this is monologue, mon monologue uh, 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 dialogue and really Socratic, I think is totally wrong. It's a non-Socratic dialogue, very much Bakhtinian, and the way in which, and it's not designed to reach agreement or consensus, but it's designed in, it is designed thus that each one, each, each one of the voices can enrich itself in ways that it could never enrich itself by talking to itself. So it, it's this dialogical dynamic which allows you to, you know, deepen your own understanding. And again, the, the, the typical Talmudic discussion is never adjudicated. It's not decided. The, the Babylonian Talmud does not produce a new mission. So with that lens, okay, then the giveaway phrase in the Mishnah Yadayim, which claims that, that those who canonized Kohelet with the Hillelites gave me, the, uh, gave me the, um, the license to read the book the way I do. All I can say is that had I not been equipped with this Neo-Kantian post papyrian time for philosophy, I wouldn't have noticed it. And I would never have read the Talmud the way I read the Talmud, and therefore never have, have read Kohelet the way I read Kohelet. But that's, you know, that's a contingent fact about, you know, my own perspective. My sense was, and I thank you so much, um, uh, Jim, for, for, for your comments on the medievals, because I'm going to run back home and get myself an education, is that my sense is that after the Gaonic period, the rabbinic Judaism turned its back on, on this anthro religious anthropology of uncertainty and diversity, which, you know, grounds this Talmudic literature, looking for codexes and authoritative rulings and so on and so forth, and doing away with the dialogue as far as possible. So, you know, that, that, that's all I've got to say. But the reading I produce is not merely spun out of my own head. It's deeply grounded in the Talmudic literature, which I tried to explain the, at the beginning. But, you know, those are the sets of texts which, um, which inform my reading. So we have about 15 minutes for a question from the audience. And 
it is your time to ask what you will. Uh, thanks so much for this presentation. Is this on? Oh, okay. I'm just making sure. All right. Um, thanks so much for this presentation. Um, I'm just curious. I noticed, uh, I think I saw Hevel was translated as vapor. Um, but then the other important word that you pointed out, yitron, how, how did you, uh, how did you eventually decide to translate that? I, I'm not sure I, I saw that. Oh, that actually, vapor at, at, as, as a translation of Hebel was proposed by R.B.Y. Scott. He, he, he translates the first verse in the Hanker Bible edition as vapor of vapors, orb is vapor. But then he goes on to explain that vapor is meaningless. And so, so he, he kind of loses, loses the connotation of fleetingness and, you know, something yes. which is real, yet ephemeral, uh, to something which can't mean anything because it's ephemeral. And that's, you know, that, that's the difference that makes the difference. Hello, see how an example of a hard modern have with translating it the way you want to translate it. In, the, in, in Joshua Blau's Judeo-Arabic dictionary, you look up Haba, does, and he says, Haba translates Hebel, therefore Hebel must mean Haba. He can't, he can't, I mean, he, he says Haba must mean Hebel because they use it as a translation. In other words, it means vanity, meaningless. So it completely transforms an Arabic term just to fit this standard reading in Belus. First, thanks to all of you. This has been amazing. Um, and now I have to get the book. But um, second, I have a couple, two questions. First, have the two of you collaborated before? Oh, OK. Yeah. And what prompted you to do this? Well, I have wanted to work on Kohelet for many, like 25 years. Um, and I won't go into the, per it's, it's in the book, but I won't go into the personal story here of why. Um, my, uh, and then about uh, nine years ago, um, my, my first husband passed away. I remarried some years later. And we were on a meet the friends and family trip to, to England and Israel. We had Shabbat dinner at Menachem's house. Um, and he asked me what I was planning to pick up next for my next project. I was working on my Kabbalah Shabbat book. And I said, well, I really wanted to do Kohelet, but each time I had looked into it, I got lost in a fog bank. Uh, there was something I was not getting. And, oh, I've written on Kohelet. Let me send you the article. And um, so I downloaded and read it the next week, and light started shining through the clouds. And, and he'd only just begun to work out his, his understanding of the book. Um, so I you know, sent him an email and informed him that I would really like to work together with him on this. And I think he thought I was a little mad. Um, I, I still wonder at my own chutzpah. And, um, but yeah, it's been a, an extraordinary collaboration. It was some years before we actually got started. We were both busy with other things, but it's uh, been an extraordinary yeah, partnership. Um, what I can say about the collaboration is is something I haven't I haven't finished figuring out. But looking at what I've written in collaboration of the way and I've written in collaboration with Deborah, and in comparison to you know, everything else I've written, basically, is that. I gained clarity, okay? It's not a dumbing down. I, I, I write complicated philosophy for philosophers. I don't write popular, you know, op-eds or... I, I, I did. My father used to do that. He was very good at him. But I, I, that, that's not my medium at all. But somehow this collaboration kind of forced me into being simple and clear without surrendering that. And um, how exactly that worked across, you know, dialoguing with, with picture it, yeah, some, somehow uh, um, 
forced me into 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 the kind of clarity which um, you know had had which isn't characteristic of of, of my writing, and um, I'm still trying to figure out how that how that how how how, how that how the collaboration affected my writing and in, 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 in that sense. We have time probably for about, hello, I'm hiding back here behind the minute, probably uh, time for about one more question. One or maybe two that were quick. And that can include a question from the panel if there's one you're dying to ask. Well, I'd like to uh, amplify that problem of how to write for different audiences and I struggle with this and uh, it seems to me that as a purist which I think you probably are too um, I'm worried about precision uh, if I'm going to say something I want to make sure I say exactly what I mean in exact, and so that it can be communicated and received in exactly the way that I want it to be. And the fear of that immense amount of precision required, so many words to get it exactly right, is just unpleasant for most people to go through. If I could, you know, like, I get the point. Why are you going on and on? You know, and that, that, Learning how to give up that commitment to that level of precision, not this because that's that, and not this because that's that, and it's not the same problem with the two of them, but both of them are problems for what I'm trying to say. Like that level of detailed precision uh, is a trap. And I, you know, I feel like I have to learn to trust both my audience and myself that I can speak clearly, I can communicate effectively without that immense level of precision. That's the clearest I ever put that to myself, by the way, right now, <laughs> right? I'm still not there yet, but that's, that's the way that I struggle with this problem. I'm very, you know, uh, I'm very keen, I appreciate very keenly what you say that the collaboration, the charity of collaboration forces you to trust and strip away the level of precision you really want. You literally have to make room for someone else, right? It's a book. It's got to be published in only so many pages and at such cost. And if they're going to get their due, you can't overwhelm the volume. And uh, that's a lesson for me. So I'm going to take that home. That makes tonight extra bonus. Thank you. Simi, I, I, I've got... I've got news to you. That <laughs> that is God's problem. It is the if the Talmudic literature teaches us anything, that even the Almighty cannot control His message. He gives down the Torah, and 150 sages read it in 150 different. And and now this isn't a joke. This is the human condition. So history. This is this is who we are, and and therefore dialogue is so important. And dialogue is Bartinian precisely because of that. Because trying to criticize you, I'm imagining who you are. But of course, I'm projecting my own my own vision of who you are onto you, and therefore presenting a, a picture of you to you, which always jars with yourself. So in real dialogue, it's like you're always listening to a to a, to, to to hearing yourself in a recording, which it, which sort of jars with your own and you know or or, or, or close circuit TV, and it's always disorienting. It's always critical. It's always uncomfortable in a sense. And in that way, dialogue doesn't convince if 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 we're talking about real norms, but it can destable. It can render us ambivalent. And once, once we're ambivalent because of that destabilization, we can create distance from ourselves. And I, I think Kohelet, in so many words, understood that. Maimonides understands that. Not in Moran of Ophim, in the Fortunfai. Trying to create distance from yourself, change, you know, go live in another place, change your clothes. 
open yourself to the critique of others. Again, he doesn't do the philosophy, but it, he, he's obviously aware that trying to create that kind of self-critical distance you need. You can't do it by talking to yourself. You need the echo chamber of people who differ with you. And, um, and, and so, so the Talmudic literature is trying to make sense of the vertical by talking on the horizontal with people who disagree with them. And then they become critical on the vertical. And of course, you know, God's message gets diversified in ways that he, with a capital H, cannot control. And, and us authors are in this sort of divine position. We think we are all the time trying to be, to be clear and precise. But then you read the reviews and where did they get everything? I thank you for putting me in such distinguished company. <laughs> God, if you're listening. <laughs> Speaking of creating distance, I think it's time for us to create distance from one another and say goodbye. But before we do that, let's leave that. Uh, take our hands.